So hello everyone. Um, I'm Martin, Martin Halsey. Uh, strangely not very well known in the English speaking world. Uh, though I'm American and obviously a native English speaker. I've been living in Europe pretty much since 1976 and in Italy since 1994. So most of my life has been in Europe and not in the English language. So it's a little bit even strange for me to speak in English. Uh, briefly, I, I uh, got involved with macrobiotics in 1976. Uh, I was playing professional basketball. I finished uh, college. I had a degree in biology. And my idea was to come to Europe and play professional basketball for one year. I'm, I, I'll show you a picture of myself so you get an idea how tall I am. And um, while I, I came to Italy and encountered someone who talked to me about macrobiotics in Michio in 1976, actually in Milan. And I'm still in Milan talking about macrobiotics and Michio Kushi. So many years later, 45 years later, I guess. In that time, I abandoned my ideas for uh, continuing my studies in biology and began studying with Micho. I became very close with Micho, organized dozens, if not hundreds of events with Micho and got to know uh, most of the major macrobiotic teachers of that time. And that's fundamentally what I wanna talk about today is this whole sort of wave of uh, Japanese pioneers who came to the West with incredible courage and incredible inspiration that often gets lost in uh, diets. Today, everyone talks about diets. We have all these doctors with diets with no oil and vegan. And, and we forget about the real heart and the DNA of macrobiotics, which is about creating a more peaceful world by creating more peaceful and healthy people. So I had a great uh, fortune to meet most of these people. and. Uh, I wrote a book about it. It's called The Vegan Samurai. It's actually one of the few books I've written in English. I've written about 20 books in Italian, uh, many of which uh, do very well. I've been just focused in Italy. That's why no one knows me. And uh, one of the few books I wrote that's actually in English. If someone's interested, they can write to us. Um, I'll leave uh, our website and I get the book. And I'll show you the book now. So anyway, I wrote this book for two fundamental, fundamental reasons. One is to actually be a testimony to these incredible people who in the 1950s and 60s came over from Japan to a country where they were not very well received with a message of peace <laughs> by way of one of the most difficult things you can imagine. That is to try to get people to change their diet. And just incredible individuals who were so inspiring and um, often get lost in the, the diets of the day. I mean, uh, naturally many people come to macrobiotics because they have problems and that's um, perfectly normal and understandable. But if macrobiotics becomes just a way of dealing with your migraines or getting rid of some sort of you know, a physical problem, you're missing 99% uh, of it. So uh, I, I wrote the book to, uh, to be testimony to these individuals. The first reason. The second reason is that uh, the vegan movement has become very uh, important throughout the Western world. Here in Italy, uh, as I'm sure it is in most of the industrialized world. Um, and although it has some great ideas, you know, the idea of not eating animal food is something that we're all uh, proposing, you know, in the 19... In the 1970s, we were all vegan without knowing it. Um, but the way that it is done very often is making people weak. And I have seen many, many people, particularly young people who, who are attracted to the idea of vegan diet because, you know, not killing and this very sentimental sort of emotional connection to animals, as well as, you know, the, the, the environmental issues, you know, many, many very positive motivations for not eating animal food. But without any sort of idea of balance. Uh, and any ideas of balance that there are are usually misguided and incomplete. So I tried to write this book also to help those who might be um, interested in, in, in eating in a more vegan way, but without getting weak. So those are the two sort of main themes of what I have to present to you today. 
So again, I've been involved in microbiotics all over the world. Uh, had a big hotel in Switzerland uh, with many friends. We did the uh, Cushy Institute in, uh, in, in Kiental, Switzerland for many years. Became the International Macrobiotic Institute, which I see has been reborn somewhere. Uh, someone else is using that name. I was working in Portugal with Chico Varetojo and Danny Weissman. We started a center in Portugal. And then in 1994, I came here to Italy, where I had the great fortune to meet my wife. I have three daughters. Uh, everything about me is Italian, except the way I look and the way I speak. <laughs> my family's Italian, my debts are Italian, my dog is Italian, uh, all my books are Italian. <laughs> so anyway, I've uh, created, with together my wife, we have uh, really a very big center that has been decimated by COVID. But uh, I have a weekly newsletter that goes out to 30,000 people. We have thousands of people who have gone through our, uh, our, for our programs, our cooking programs and healing programs. We actually have a healing program that's recognized by the state of Italy. And you become a macrobiotic counselor and you're officially recognized. I think it's the only place in the world where that's true. Now we have to sort of, uh, we need a new uh, renaissance uh, Renaissance, a, a French word that should be an Italian word because it started in Italy. And uh, we're, we're off to a good start uh, after such, you know, the, basically the third world, world, world war happened. And I think as most of you know, Northern Italy has been one of the most hardest hit uh, places for uh, COVID. It was really dramatic a year ago. Uh, all through the night, you'd hear ambulances and there were coffins building up. Uh, so it's been a very difficult time as I'm sure it has been for many of you. And um, <clears throat> so we have this, this 25 year history of thousands of graduates, of tens of thousands of people who are in contact with us and we're about to be reborn uh, the best we can. And uh, if you're interested on our website, I have a whole series of articles and uh, information in English um, I don't know how I could communicate uh, in a written form or website. Uh, how can I do that? I don't know. I'll do that for you. I'll post the website here on the chat. Okay. We, have a, we have a name. The, the school uh, has a name in Italian that's essentially untranslatable. Uh, La Sanagola it really means the healthy throat in Italian, which doesn't mean anything in English. But it's, it's, a, very, it's a very sort of a catchy name in Italian. And uh, as I say, we have probably one of the biggest natural foods, macrobiotic training programs in the world. Um, and we're hidden and no one knows about us. Anyway, let me get to the point. Um, I wrote this book called The Vegan Samurai um, out of uh, a conversation I had with a friend in England. I have a very good friend in England. His name is Paul Lambeth. He also, his son is a very good cook up in Sweden. Jack Lambeth, and we were talking about, um, you know, how people are getting weak. And he mentioned an experience that he had with Shizuko Yamamoto. I don't know how many of you ever met Shizuko Yamamoto, who was a fabulous person, one of the nicest people you ever meet, one of the most talented, best teachers, just inspiring individuals. And the book is dedicated to Shizuko. So anyway, Paul was at a, um, at a, a training program in London with Shizuko. And Shizuko was not very good uh, at speaking. Her, her, her power was more in her hands and in her presence. So she was sort of having difficulty uh, teaching in English. So Paul asked her what in America we would call a softball question, a question that, you know, very easy for her to answer. So Paul said, uh, Shizuko, why are you and each in all of these, you know, all of these great Japanese teachers, how is it that you have so much energy and so much inspiration to share your message? How is that possible? And, uh, and Shizuko basically looked at him in a very disdainful way and just said, well, because we eat strong food. And that's the essence of the book. And let me just share, uh, I'll share the book with you. And uh, well, actually, first of all, let me show you a picture of myself and Micho to give you an idea how tall I am or how short Micho was. I don't know who has the biggest ears, but um, that's about 50. Micho, Micho was not short. Well, compared to me, you're short. <laughs> yeah, well. Not short as an Italian, as a Japanese man, for sure. 
uh, his, his wife was, Aveline was really short. Anyway, that's me 15 years ago with Micho. I'm six foot nine for those of you who are American, two meters four for those who are, are more meter oriented. And let me share the book with you and I'll just kind of go along with the book. And I think it's a kind of a good way to, um, to conduct this whole event here. <clears throat> So these in samurai, keys to creating the strongest possible vegan diet for body, mind, and spirit. I think that really kind of defines the book, although it is at the same time, like I say, a testimony to this wave, fundamentally a wave of these students of George Osawa who came to the West, which is, I mean, it's hard to imagine uh, the kind of inspiration, the kind of energy, the kind of idealism and the conviction that they had to do this. I mean, it's something that uh, I really wrote the book to, uh, to try to convey that idea. Uh, I, I left America uh, when I was 22 years old. And um, you know, I know what it means to leave your home and leave the language that you speak and go to somewhere new. And in speaking with Micho, Micho basically left Japan as a very young man, more or less around 22 years old and didn't return for 15 years. I don't know if you can really appreciate what that means. And he never spoke good English, <laughs> even at the end. He had a great deal of this trouble with English. But such power and such uh, inspiration and enthusiasm and was able to create this enormous movement around him together with his wife, Aveline, who was equally strong, if not stronger, uh, than Micho. So these are really people that need to be remembered and recognized. And Shizuka Yamamoto was just the most powerful person you ever... Um, actually, I, I, maybe I'll start off just telling you stories about Shizuko. This is that the quote that I mentioned before, because we eat strong food, was her response to um, my friend Paul. One time we organized an event in Switzerland, a summer uh, event with, with 960 people. 960 people is a lot of people from all over the world, translated into four languages. I was essentially the managing director of that event. And at that event, there was a woman who was, who was um, out of her mind, just literally, um, I don't know the right term to give her, but she was a raving lunatic, and to put it into layman's terms. And um, all through the week, we had a great deal of difficulty dealing with this woman who was screaming and yelling and going to classes and interrupting events. Uh, until finally on the last day, this woman got a torch, literally had a torch and was gonna burn down a building. And no one knew what to do until Shizuko just walked up to this woman, grabbed her, held on to her and just calmed her down like in one second. <laughs> it was the most incredible thing I've ever seen. Uh, in another event, Shizuko, uh, we were all in Rotterdam. In Rotterdam, I think we're talking about the end of the 1980s. And there was a, a peace day in, in Holland, hundreds of thousands of people. And there was this huge church that we rented, that we rented, that the organizers in Holland rented. And Micho was going to come to speak, Micho Kushi. And everyone is there waiting for Micho. And uh, what they forgot was that Micho couldn't arrive by car. So he was stuck in traffic and there was all these people kind of waiting there for Micho to arrive. And one by one, different teachers got up and tried to entertain the group to keep them from leaving. Until finally, Shizuka stood up and she got behind the dais with the microphone and she starts um, describing her experiences with the war in Japan and the consequences of the uh, atom bomb. And she was talking about people coming to her home, literally without skin on their body. I mean, just this unbelievable story. And she was standing behind this, this uh, dais, you know, this kind of, um, I can't even think of the word in English anymore, with, where you stand behind the, the, the thing. And the, the people were not really giving her the right attention. And it was a huge church. So when she realized that she didn't have the group following her, she stepped away and walked up to the front of a, the, let's say the sort of um, the, the uh, raised up uh, platform and just spoke louder 
until the whole place was silent. It was just this like pure physical charisma that this woman had. Uh, and, and I tried to try, I tried to describe this uh, in the book. I mean, these are people that uh, are in the DNA of everything that all of us are doing, all of us who are involved in macrobiotic education or sharing shiatsu or cooking or whatever. There is this fundamental power that um, these people had and they, uh, they conferred to us. Right? It's like a, a virus, you know, think about a, pand a pandemia that we have today. They, who, anyone who met them, anyone who met, or, you know, um, George Osawa or Micha Kushi or, or Abilene Kushi or Shizuko Yamamoto or Herman and, uh, and Cornelia Ihara, uh, they were just, just, you know, just an aura of power and conviction and desire to share and, and create a, a better world. So that, that is uh, part of the message. And, and in this book, I, 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 I share the story of many different people, including, this is the first teacher of Osawa, Izizuka, who was a, a, a doctor in the Japanese army, who ultimately uh, introduced George Osawa to uh, the use of diet. And George Osawa, I never met George Osawa, I have some recordings of him, but he must have had a charisma that is beyond anything that, you know, uh, any of us have ever encountered because he, he inspired so many people, uh, including Micho and Abilene and Shizuko and Ohio, all this whole group. So anyway, I recount, I recount their stories. And then through the book, I kind of just explain what macrobiotics is about. My idea with this book is to share the idea of balance what balanced diet means for those who are interested in um, vegan diet, you know, so that it's not just about um, getting the right molecules, how many, how much protein you get or how much vitamins, you know, we all get lost in the molecules and we uh, miss the essence. So in this book, I kind of go over basic yin and yang. I'm sure all of you are fairly familiar with basic yin and yang, which I describe as natural laws. Um, how we live in a world of opposites and a world of polarity and how this um, plays out in our diet and in our health. In each chapter in this book, I kind of talk about these natural uh, laws. Uh, the main one is really once, once you've got yin and yang down, you understand that when we eat a food, <clears throat> it has an effect on us. You know, it can it can make us more tense, it can make us more relaxed, it can make us warmer, it can cool us off. You know, what really macrobiotics is about is understanding that food has an effect. It can make you, you know, more, more it can make you dry your body out or lubricate your body, it can make your body more tense, it can make your body more relaxed, warm you up, cool you off. This is the way that we think about food and we use uh, the terms yin and yang to help us to define the effects of food. So once you've kind of got the idea of yin and yang or the idea of opposites, then the main, the main principle of macrobiotics is how we relate to the environment. And here's where the main problem with vegan diet is. You have people in Northern Italy, I'm in Milan. Milan is not even Mediterranean. You know, people talk about Mediterranean macrobiotics. Mediterranean macrobiotics is about Southern Italy. Northern Italy is more Central Europe. So where I live and teach, is in a cold, damp climate. And that means you need to eat foods that are warming and help, you, help your body to dry out, to keep dry in the, in, the, in the cold, damp weather. The traditional grain in the north of Italy is millet. Um, actually, if, if you come to Italy at some point when you can travel again, uh, in Verona, I, I go to Verona once a week. I, we have a center in Verona as well. <clears throat> there was a there's a, a piazza, a square where there's a monument from the 1600s that recalls when the, the millet crop failed and, and many thousands of people died because they lived on millet. Millet is a grain that dries your body. It's, it's the ideal grain for a damp climate, climate. So, you know, the traditional diet in Italy had very little animal food and lots of grains, vegetables and beans. So now with the idea of vegan diet, they introduce all these crazy uh, tropical foods, lots of bananas and coconut oil and all these superfoods. You know, the superfoods today are all tropical. They're all cooling 
and they can make you weak if you have a vegan diet. And I don't know how much, how many of you are more uh, expert in the use of yin and yang, but if someone is eating lots of meat and eggs and cheese, it might be very useful for them to eat, eat lots of turmeric or lots of coconut oil or you know, things that cool you off. But <clears throat> if you're eating grains, beans, and vegetables, and you're not having any animal food, if you eat lots of these sort of tropical foods, they're gonna make you weak. They're gonna make you cold. And, and that's what happens for a lot of people who uh, go on a vegan diet, because uh, we talk about these super foods based on, you know, oh, met, we put linseed oil everywhere because of the omega-3 uh, oils in them. You know, they make you cold. They'll make you weak if you take a lot of raw oil, no matter what it is. Uh, so we get lost in the, in the molecules is what I'm saying. So the essence- So Martin, if, if this is a good time to interrupt, are there some supplements or food uh, additives, whatever that you recommend, like uh, chia or brewer's yeast, or uh, I don't know, is there anything you do enjoy or recommend? Actually, no. <laughs> I think that uh, if you need to supplement your diet, your diet is not balanced. And, uh, you know, many of these foods, which are based on the omega-3 oils, are like a solution looking for a problem. You know, we have no problem with omega-3 oils. We don't have an imbalance in the oils in our diet. So if someone enjoys, Mitchell used to always say this, say this, well, if you enjoy it, then please take it, but you don't really need it. <laughs> so if someone really enjoys chia seeds or linseed oil, or uh, I don't know what the other, you know, turmeric is a big thing, uh, coconut, all kinds of things connected to coconuts. Uh, they really, there's no need for them. You know, they, and they really are not- Goji berries is big. Yeah, well, those are a little bit more temperate as uh, their origin. They're not so yin. You know, essentially most of these superfoods are very yin. Also like uh, kombucha or kefir, uh, these unsalted uh, fermented foods. They're not really that good for you if you're on a vegan diet and you live in a cold climate. You know, they make you weak. Uh, it's so important to, <clears throat> to get in touch with traditional foods from where you come from, because they really give you an idea of uh, how to make balance with your climate. And that's why the idea of vegan samurai is also so important, because Jap Japan, to my knowledge, and the research I've done on it, is the only country that for centuries was vegan. And we're talking about you know, six or 700, I, I quote the date in the book here somewhere, <clears throat> that Japan was actually vegan for, for a period of time, for a long period of time. Um, let me see if I can find the date. Anyway, so they, they had, because the, the emperor became uh, Buddhist, and as he became Buddhist, everyone had to become vegan, 676 AD. In 676 AD, the emperor became Buddhist and became vegan. So the entire country became vegan for hundreds of years, for centuries. So what happened during that time was that Japan created a way of eating, a vegan way of eating that was in harmony with a cold, damp climate and a very rigorous lifestyle. And they didn't use a lot of raw food. In fact, they eat no raw food. And they developed things like miso, shoyu, omazio, umeboshi, um, short grain rice. They developed a vegan diet that gives you incredible strength. And that's really what macrobiotics is about. That's what, you know, Shizuka Yamamoto was saying to my friend. We eat strong food. Strong food is food that's in harmony with the cold climate. And it can be very easily vegan. Generally, I don't recommend that people necessarily become vegan. It's a choice, but essentially not more than 1% of your diet needs to be animal food, just to keep the, you don't have to take a, a supplement, a, B, a B12 supplement. So um, I'm not a big fan of a lot of supplements, a lot of the superfoods. Uh, I think they can make you weak. I, I don't know in the various countries how that goes. Uh, and it depends on the climate of your country. You know, another thing I, that I present in this book is uh, Italian diet, because I recognize, you know, the incredible gift that these Japanese people bought, to, which is mainly their enthusiasm, 
and their uh, principles, the principles of balance. But the diet, um, I think that people make a mistake and I've seen it very often over these 45 years, you said 50 years, 45 years, <laughs> over these 45 years, is that um, <clears throat> it's a mistake to follow a very Japanese diet in a climate that's very different from Japan because it, make, it, it can hurt, it creates problems. The traditional Japanese diet, the Japanese diet that Micho and, and the various uh, Japanese teachers introduced is very young. And um, most macrobiotic people, as they, as they age, aging is a young process. So as we get older, our hair gets gray, our, our eyes get more contracted. So macrobiotic people tend to develop young problems as they get older because the, the diet is too young. Uh, so you need to try to find, need to, I, I've try, I try to teach here in Italy to get, to get as close as you can to the traditional way of eating uh, that's been going on for thousands of years. Italy has this incredible, you know, history uh, on every level, cultural, scientific, technological, and the diet that's the envy of the world. And I presented this book here in somewhere, let me see if I can find the title, uh, that Italian Samurai. Uh, Italy, if you're looking for a grain-based diet, there's no diet in the world that uses more grains than Italy. Uh, Italy, if you go from like Sicily all the way up into the mountains, in the mountains they use buckwheat. Buckwheat is used for a certain kind of pasta, pizzoccheri, if any of you know Italian food, or they put it together with polenta in Valtellina. Valtellina is a valley in the north of Italy, and they make polenta with, my, with, with corn and buckwheat. Then millet, like, as I said, in the whole Po Valley, the whole Po Valley is what basically goes from Torino to Venice. Uh, they eat millet in the middle of Italy. Today, I'm speaking to you from Tuscany. I'm here with my family on vacation in, uh, in Tuscany. And here, the traditional diet is based on um, farro or spelt, a kind of traditional wheat product. And they, and they also use lots of barley, barley soup, spelt. Uh, they also have bread with no salt in it. <laughs> in, in Tuscany, there was a revolt against the government and they stopped putting salt in the, in the bread. So as you go like from the north of Italy down from buckwheat to millet, and then the north of Italy has the best, some of the best rice in the world. The, the Chinese come to Italy to buy rice. So buckwheat and millet and rice and barley and, and, and spelt. And then Southern Italy is the place of uh, pasta. You know? In the South of Italy, they use two grains. They use, they use pasta and bread and then they have bread and pasta. That's all they eat in the South of Italy. If anyone wants to have rice, they say, well, you're sick. You have to eat rice because you're sick. Although in Sicily, they do have some couscous. And um, so I don't know of any other country that has so many traditional grains. And if you want to create a grain-based diet, you can use the Italian format as a very um, you know, ideal macrobiotic way of eating. Clearly in harmony with the diet. So there's a winter way of eating, there's a summer way of eating, there's a more northern Italian way of eating, more southern Italian way of eating, and they're very different. You know, so I explain that as well in this book. Like my wife, her family is from the Hill of the Boot, Puglia, the very south of Italy, where the climate is more dry and, and warm. And they use lots of raw oil, raw olive oil which the Japanese just couldn't believe that they would eat raw oil. No Japanese would eat raw oil. Whereas as you go further north in Italy, the traditional uh, use of oil is butter. They didn't even use oil so because of the climate. They're very different climatic regions and very different types of food. Uh, it's incredible. People think of Italian food and they think of one kind of food, but it's just enormously different. If you go from like Sicily and down the hill of the boot, into Milan in Northern Italy. And it's really a reflection of the climate and always based on grains, beans, and vegetables, seasonal fruit, high quality condiments. Italian diet is like a perfect uh, fit for macrobiotic principles. So uh, that's another thing I try to convey in the book. It makes it easier for people. You have to make macrobiotics easy. Uh, if you talk to people about pasta and beans in Italy, it's much easier than azuki and inziki. You know, uh, 
And eventually they can discover about Edzuki and Edziki if they want. But um, just traditional Italian ways of eating, taking out all the, he all the heavy animal food can be very, very uh, strengthening. So I try to explain that in the diet here as well. Italian samurai, different teachers here in Italy. And I go over like pasta and beans uh, in the south of Italy. Uh, pasta and all kinds of beans is like daily fare. And if you do it right, it's some of the best food in the world. Uh, I think it's the only place in the world where they eat pasta and beans together. Uh, anyway, that's a personal favorite. This gentleman here is Ferro Ledvinka. He was, uh, he's no longer with us. He was sort of the father of macrobiotics in, in Italy. Uh, he was a good, he was one of my teachers and one of my good friends while he was still with us. And uh, I try to explain his story as well, because, you know, again, in every country, there are uh, vegan samurais, you know, like the real pioneers. Uh, on Wednesday evening, we have a, a course every Wednesday evening, I do a, a Zoom lecture, and we're going to have Bill Tara with us. Bill Tara was one of the real first uh, pioneers of macrobiotics. And Ferro Ledvinka in Italy was, you know, the first. Uh, in each country, we have those kind of real traditional diet teachers. Lino Stankic, Lino and Jane Stankic, Denny Waxman. Um, there's all kinds of vegan samurais around uh, the macrobiotic movement. And um, I, I think that most of them are involved in this, in this uh, series, of, uh, uh, series of lectures that you're presenting. So my compliments to your, your choice of uh, people. Um, don't know what else, you know, to really describe. Herman and Cornelia Hara, I don't know who knew her, Herman and Cornelia. I can tell you stories, you know, what we call these war stories. When we get together, old macros, we go over these stories. And Herman and Cornelia were incredible people as well. They're so different from Micho. You know, Micho was on the East Coast of America and he was always in a three-piece suit and a tie. And Herman was on the West Coast and he was always in a plaid shirt and jeans. Uh, he was a great fisherman. And he was sort of the country philosopher. And his wife was just uh, Cornelia, just uh, a powerhouse. She was just unstoppable. <laughs> Always these, these couples, Micho and Abilene, Herman and, and Cornelia. Uh, and, and I had the great opportunity to work with all of them and know them. And I tell little stories uh, in, in the book about my experiences with them. Um, one quick story about Cornelia, who was... Uh, she was just, you know, again, a, a, a spark plug of energy. When she'd do cooking class, she looked like a, a, a Japanese peasant in a hurry <laughs> doing cooking class. And her English was so difficult to understand. So one time there was a big uh, macrobiotic congress. We used to have these European and, and, and world congresses that was in Florence, where I am right now, it's near Florence. And, um, and Michi was there, and Aveline was there, and Herman Ehara, and Cornelia Hanna, and Shizuka Yamamoto and all kinds of guests from Japan and all over the world. And there was this panel discussion and each, each of the, uh, the participants shared some of their memories of Herman, of, uh, of Giorgio Sala. So the first one to speak was, was uh, Cornelia. Who's ever first is always the most young. That's a, that's a principle in life. So she went on and on and on with the microphone and no one understood what, what she was talking about. You couldn't understand it. So Herman took the microphone from her and he said, did anyone understand what my wife just said? <laughs> it was hilarious. And, you know, they had this whole kind of running, uh, you know, sort of taking, uh, I don't even know the, the way to describe it, making fun of each other, these Japanese teachers, uh, always with respect and with, uh, you know, great reverence towards Giorgio Sawa as their, as their uh, mentor. Um, so I, Herman and Cornelia, let me see if I have anyone else I can talk to you about. And then I'll be happy to talk about food and making balance. I really don't know what your uh, experience is. Uh, this book is really about the ABCs of macrobiotics. Now, Buro Muromoto, out, another student of Micho who was out on the West Coast. I didn't have much experience with him, but I went out to visit him once. And um, I wanted to make, show you, I used to, one of the many things I did in my life was I had a tofu factory 
uh, near Geneva, Switzerland. I was like crazy. I didn't speak French. I didn't uh, know how to make tofu, but I decided after my basketball career to make a tofu factory. I have no idea why, you know, what kind of inspiration caused me to do that. But I opened a, a tofu factory and I, and I, I actually introduced tempeh to south, the, south, the entire south of Europe. I think on my grave that will put, he introduced tempeh to Southern Europe. Anyway, at one point I wanted to make shoyu because I figured everybody likes shoyu. So I went out to visit um, this gentleman here, Naburo Muramoto. And Japanese are very formal. <clears throat> so I wrote all these letters introducing myself and telling him, and you know, established a date when I was gonna arrive. And I, and I got there, he had no idea who I was or why I was there. <laughs> and I sat down in his living room and I had one of the most surreal experiences of my entire life of sitting in silence with a Japanese teacher uh, who didn't know I was there. <laughs> anyway, uh, he was a great uh, producer of natural foods and a uh, great writer. Uh, if any of you know, Healing Ourselves. And he wrote another book on natural immunity. Two excellent books. He was a great scholar, terrible teacher, honest, honestly, to be perfectly honest. He couldn't, he couldn't put two words together. But as a writer, he was brilliant. So I talk about him as well. He was an important teacher, uh, one of the students of Osawa as well. And um, so that's the essence of what I wanted to talk to you about today, to, <clears throat> to record you, to be testimony to these incredible individuals. And at the same time, to talk about, you know, uh, Japan, what Japan offers us. Japan offers us the only experience that I know of, maybe someone can tell me about other experiences, of a whole culture of millions of people following a vegan diet for many generations. I don't think there's any other experience of that. Many vegetarian countries in India where they use dairy products or whatever, but a country that is completely vegan, and of course we have no way of confirming that that was totally vegan, but in theory, uh, they eat no animal food. And based on that, vegan um, choice, they created uh, a diet that gave incredible strength. You know, I often say to people, I, I do counseling, I see a lot of people in counseling. Maybe I'll tell you some counseling stories as well. This is not basically tell you war stories today. Um, I see a lot of people in counseling and people come for counseling and I say, what do you, you know, tell me what you eat, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And very often they say, well, I'm vegan. <laughs> And I say to them, well, that tells me what you don't eat. Tell me what you do eat. That's what's interesting. If we wanted to figure out what's, what's, what's creating your problem. And, uh, and it takes people by surprise, you know, and they're, they're more focused on what they don't eat. Whereas macrobiotics is completely the opposite. If you choose to have some animal food, it's not that big a deal. If you choose not to have animal food, it's not that big a deal. What is a big deal is what is 90% of your diet? If 90% of your diet is whole grains, seasonal vegetables, beans, high quality condiments, let me see if I have an image here. No, I don't even have the, the classic uh, pyramid in this book. If the basis of your diet is whole grains, vegetables, beans, high quality condiments, some fermented food, uh, you have a good diet. Then with or without a small quantity of animal food is not really that relevant. And then what the Japanese the, first, the greatest gift I think they give us in terms of uh, food is the fermented foods, miso, shoyu, umeboshi. These are unique foods that in the West, there is no, um, no equivalent here in Italy. Italy is a Mecca of food and they have wonderful, you know, uh, balsamic vinegar and wine and uh, you know, all kinds of fermented food from North to South but something that's nearly as strong as miso or shoyu uh, or umeboshi, there's nothing similar. So I think that those are some things that, that we can, uh, no matter what kind of a climate you live in or what kind of a tradition you're more, you're more um, close to, uh, those foods are interesting. Those particularly at this time of, you know, weak immune systems and problems with, um, COVID. I also wrote a book on how to protect ourselves from viruses. I could show you that as well. That I also have in English. 
Um, I, I sometimes write in English, I sometimes write in Italian. If I write in Italian, my Italian needs to be translated into Italian. So my wife and my daughters, my daughter translates my, 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 uh, most of my stuff. They said, well, Dad, just write in English and then we'll translate it into Italian. Because <laughs> your Italian is so bad, we have to do it all over and again anyway. So I've been writing some books in English and at some point, maybe if some of you have uh, connections to uh, publishing in an in English language, uh, you can help me out. So I have another book on um, you know, how, to, <clears throat> how to strengthen your health, how to prevent um, viral infections. Because <clears throat> within this whole kind of uh, COVID period, everyone's talking about vaccines, but no one's talking about how to make yourself stronger. You know, so uh, again, miso, shoy, use of seaweeds, all of these foods that have come from Japan are just tremendous. Martin, important. if you want to stop your screen share, and we have about five, 10 minutes, and maybe people have specific questions. Hello. Okay. So, uh, I don't know if people have specific questions. Also, someone is asking, how can we find your book? Well, you can write us. Just write to us, and we'll write you back and send you a copy. Or so I'll I'll post your uh, email address just to on speak. the website. Just on the website. There's info. Oh, okay. You know, okay. I'm just com. I'm just getting geared up for English. Um, I, for some reason, I just. <laughs> I guess what happened? I came to Italy. And uh, I suddenly had three children, you know, like boom, boom, boom. <laughs> and I didn't have time to think about anything but developing our center, uh, our cooking school, and, uh, and making a living. So it's only now my kids are getting older uh, that I'm starting to think about maybe doing some uh, some things in English. So if anyone's interested, and there's a whole series of articles I wrote about twenty or thirty articles in English uh, on the website that I think might be interesting. So any questions, I'm more than happy to. I'm just sort of rambling about uh, macrobiotics and, uh, and Japan. So I wonder if we have, do we have any vegans in our group that would like to talk about what you eat or does it, I mean, this is an opportunity to speak with a senior macrobiotic counselor. So if you have questions, we have a few minutes left. I really encourage you to take advantage, to take this opportunity. Anybody? The biggest mistake vegans make is eating lots of raw food. Lots like of? Raw food. Mm -hmm. You know, if you live in a cold, damp climate, you know, raw food cools you off. And it's great if you live in, a, you know, in the summer or in a hot place. But if you live in a cold, damp place, I, I don't know how, how many people know Northern Italy. Northern Italy is famous for fog. It's like you live in a swamp. And you need to eat foods that don't make you cold and damp. So the biggest mistake I see with many people in Northern Italy, vegan people and vegetarian people, is they eat too much raw oil and raw salad and raw fruit, and it's all, and, and it makes you weak, and, and, and you know, predisposes you to infectious disease, bladder infections, candida, that kind of thing. I have a comment or a question, uh, Ginat. It's Alice. Sure. Sorry. Yes, Sorry. I know. Hi. Hi. Sorry, I'm not, I'm not on the video. Hi, Martin. Thank you Hi. for your. Um, so I'm from Northern Italy. I'm from uh, Friuli, Venezia, Giulia. Mm, and, that's very north. Very north. And uh, they eat radicchio there every single day of the year. <laughs> they cool. have a million, a million varieties. So when I'm there, it's so delicious. And, you know, it, it, it just fits in with the food, et cetera, et cetera. You know, uh, Italians grow. I, I live in Canada, but Italians grow it here. And they, you know, the traditional people, I guess, eat it not as much as they used to when they first came to Canada. Um, I just want you to uh, know, um, uh, hear your uh, views on that. I just find it fascinating. <laughs> that things are better in Italy? No, no, no. The, 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 um, the value of radicchio or the benefits of radicchio or- oh, just, You know, it's just like Italy. Well, let me, let me turn your question around. Sure. So, <clears throat> Again, relating to Japan and Japanese macrobiotic diet. In Japan, they eat lots of seaweeds, okay? And seaweeds are just these huge quantities of minerals. Now, the reason they eat so many seaweeds is because they don't have space to grow vegetables. So they went into the sea to get their vegetables. 
Italy, from north to south, there's loads of these wonderful greens, and uh, even though radicchio is often not green, um, these vegetables that are just powerhouses of vitamins and, and minerals. Uh, my wife is from in Puglia. Puglia, they eat uh, uh, cima di rapa. Cima di rapa, I don't even know what it is in English anymore. Uh, Rapini. It's uh, broccoli rob, rapini. Broccoli rob, there it is. We have it every day, every day. <laughs> and so other you, kinds of similar green vegetables. So, so Italian diet. So uh, I married into a, a Southern Italian family and they had rapini every day. <laughs> every day. It was, when I first started eating it, it was so bitter. It became sweet over time, but it was so bitter. It was very similar, not similar to, but the same bitterness as radicchio, you know, very strong. That's a, yeah. that's a, that's a classic taste in Italy, is bitter sweet. Bitter, see, these are bitter vegetables, but the more you cook them, they become sweet. And it's addictive. Mm -hmm. and it's yes. Addictive. Like, I, I'm from New Jersey. <laughs> and in New Jersey, we don't have a lot of these bitter vegetables. I met my wife and there's all these bitter vegetables and I'm saying, wow. And after a while, I said, wow, where are the bitter vegetables? <laughs> yeah, I want them. Yeah. And, but, but they're just powerhouses of iron and calcium and, and all the whole, you know, the whole range of minerals uh, together with fiber. Uh, it's one of the secrets of Italian diets that people don't really realize is the, the sheer amount of green vegetables or leafy vegetables that people eat. And, uh, and you know, again, in Japan, they have all these seaweeds because they don't have space to grow lots of vegetables. I think, I, I think that's something that needs to be understood as well. Italian diet is very interesting. I think it's a real example for the world because there's so many climates involved. You know, mm -hmm. if you go from Sicily, it's a hot, warm, dry climate. If you go to Friuli, it's cold and damp. Mm -hmm. Basically the diet there, at least my parents, was polenta, borlotti beans because in, North, in the part that I'm from, they don't know any other bean. They just know portolotti beans. Mm -hmm. So, and um, radicchio and every single day and some animal food, a little bit of animal food, a little bit of, you know, dairy. Cured, cured meats. And, and cured meats, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, well that goes, yeah. Well now everywhere you go, there's pork grills. Well, yeah. before COVID. So well, that's, that's the area of Italy where they're famous for drinking uh, white wine. Mm -hmm. wine. But they... They tend to drink to excess in that area, well, and it doesn't, it doesn't seem to affect them because you know. <laughs> well, no, it does. It it, it it affects them, and and it's it's because of the too way way too much animal food now, way out of proportion. Absolutely, absolutely. Anyways, thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. That's a good point about Italian diet. You know, the the fact of uh, grains and beans. You know, to eat grains and beans and a wide variety of vegetables that vary from season to season, from region to region. The quality of the soil in one area is different from another. And they're just vastly different traditions. You know, like from Friuli. Friuli is the Northeast. Beautiful area, very cold, damp winter. It's completely different from the Southeast where my wife is from. Uh, just completely different uh, in terms of, you know, the, the, the condiments, the, the kinds of vegetables and uh, the kinds of animal food. The further north you go in Italy, the, the, the longer like these cured meats and like parmigiano and those are really northern Italian things and not southern Italian. In south things are much lighter. That reflects the climate. And this is something that macrobiotics has to offer to the world. Even if people maybe they, they can't get their head around the yin and yang, that you need to eat according to your climate. You know, it's not a good idea to eat lots of tropical foods in the winter, in a place that's cold and wet, it's going to make you weak. But that's hard to describe. That's hard to explain unless you have some idea about balance, which you can't get from uh, nutritional science. You just can't get it. You know, I, I have a degree in biology. I try to explain things in terms of proteins and minerals, but certain things you just cannot describe in terms of biochemistry. So that's a great gift that we have to share. And we need to find ways to share it. So Israel, Martin, is a subtropical climate. Mm -hmm. So we're not we're not we're not as tropical as Miami or Florida. We are subtropical. In other words, I have a coconut uh, tree in outside this window in my yard, and it doesn't give any fruit, any coconuts. The tree is there. It just doesn't. It's too cold in the winter to uh -huh. have any 
coconuts. Yeah. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. in the winter, it's chilly. It's wet and cold. Mm -hmm. In the summer, it's hot, hot and hotter. Depends how the further south you go. So figuring out our diet is pretty different than uh, Boston. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And that's yeah. really important. That's fundamentally important to, to appreciate that. Also, like if you go to the uh, more, you know, Middle Eastern, really hot, dry climates, sweet foods like dates, they make you, they make you, they create humidity in the body. And whereas dates in Milan, they just make you weak. So, you know, the same foods can have a very different effect according to, you know, how you relate to the climate. Fundamentally important. So Israel, yeah, that's a real challenge to find, find out. Yeah. Things are somewhat extreme here, as are the people. For example, um, winter to summer has, you know, a tiny little like spring and fall are really like, you know, in a few weeks they're gone. Mm -hmm. And and day to night, it, it's it's a half hour before the sun setting and the sunset. And I know in Europe it's hours, it's this long. We <laughs> so so things are more radical or more extreme here, the food as well and the people as well. So it's interesting. Yeah, you really need to take a, a look into what the traditional grains and traditional cooking styles and condiments, mm -hmm. use of spice, use of fruit, all those things are very important for climate. Like in, in India, where it's so hot and hot and damp, they use very intense spice because it makes you sweat and it cools your body off. Which that's not true everywhere. That's not a good idea everywhere. So people make that mistake, you know. Something that can be extremely beneficial in one climate can really make you weak in another climate. And that's uh, important. You know? Yin and yang, you have to get into the yin and yang. Yin and yang. Well, Martin, it's left for me only to thank you. Mille grazie. Thank you so much. We really appreciate having you on and your wisdom and your words. So thank you very much. Well, thank you all. Uh, check out our website. There's lots of English stuff on there if you're interested in in my book on the vegan samurai or how to protect yourself from viruses, there's two there in English. Um, so we can figure out a way to get them to you, an ebook or something. And uh, good luck with this continuing series. My compliments to your effort and uh, desire to uh, share and uh, spread the word. Well, thank you for being part. Bye-bye <laughs> okay. everyone.